morena everyone, tēnā tātou katoa and welcome to our talk on the New Zealand Games rebate. Before we dive in, I want you to take a moment to imagine something with us. Let's cast our minds back 10 years. Picture a small group of enthusiastic Kiwi game developers, perhaps working in a shared office space. They're juggling freelance work just to pay the bills, all the while trying to bring their dream game to life. The local industry is supportive, of course, but resources and funding opportunities are almost non-existent. Schools and universities are teaching generalist game dev skills, but gaps definitely exist in areas like game design and games production. This team has a vision, a game deeply inspired by their culture, but without dedicated funding or support, they struggle to move beyond their prototyping phase. Now, let's fast forward to today and imagine how their journey might have unfolded differently with a game's ecosystem in place to support them along their way. With the foundations of support laid today, our studio flourishes. They've received startup funding from the Center of Digital Excellence, which meant early support and mentorship along the way. Schools and universities now offer education in game design, production, and storytelling, which brings along a new generation of all genders that see game development as a viable career choice. Our studio brings in local talent and also maintains a strong backbone of seniors who provide further mentorship and guidance, which all leads to New Zealand becoming known as a games powerhouse overall. With our government funding, also international investment and partnerships, we create opportunities for the local studios. They work on ambitious projects in a vibrant culture, which further attracts talent from across the world, all the while local developers find career progression right here at home. Our studio's dream of a game inspired by local culture is now a reality. In a thriving ecosystem where innovation is supported every step of the way, and New Zealand is recognized on the global stage for contributions to game development. I'm Toby. And I'm Chantelle. And before we go further, a little bit about the two of us and our amazing team at New Zealand On Air. So, tēnā kato kato, ko ko tarangi te whakapaparanga mai, ingari ko waikanae te whenua tūpū, ko kapiti te kainga, ko kapiti mō te re te maonga eru nā taku nāko, Ko rokawa moana te moana e mahoa nei aku maharahara, ke te whanganui a tāre o e noho ana, he kai whakahaere, ko papa o e irirangi te motu, ko Chantal Aho, tēnā tātou katoa. So, hello everyone, my name is Chantal, and I was born and raised on the beautiful Kapiti Coast where I first fell in love with the ocean and nature. I'm the former CEO of Dinosaur Polo Club and former board member of the New Zealand Games Festival, and I really care about doing my part to give back to my games community, especially when it comes to helping support the creation of equitable pathways for our diverse folk. Now, I do my mahi for the awesome team at New Zealand On Air as the program director for our first ever national games rebate. Outside of work, I'm what you might call a bit of a serial hobbyist. I pick up on average four new hobbies a year. So if you want to chat about anything from pottery to singing, I am your person. I share my home with two delightful Flemish giant house bunnies, Lilu and Benny. And if you've never seen a Flemish giant rabbit, I would definitely give them a Google after the talk. Um, I also love to travel and learn about other cultures, and I've been lucky enough to visit 32 countries so far. But I'm always on the lookout for my next adventure. Alrighty, that's me. Over to Toby. Tēnā tātou katoa, ko whoks kaute te maonga, ko del te awa, no hamene a hau, ko Lars toku whānau, ko Toby toku ingoa. Hi everyone, I'm Toby. I'm the GDSR program manager at Irirangi Tamotu New Zealand on air. Uh, I grew up in Germany, and I was a guild leader in the Lord of the Rings Online early on, which that experience led me to join Riot Games in 2012, uh, moving across to Ireland, and that took me on to an inspiring journey of growth throughout six years uh, before coming across to New Zealand in 2018 with my wife. We ended up in the Tron initially, Hamilton, the city of the future. It was a good time. I worked as an agile coach across a couple of um, wider tech companies, uh, and we rescued a Hunterway mix, who is now waiting patiently at home. 
Uh, we came across to Te Whanganui Atara Wellington last year, and I joined New Zealand on air in June of this year. I really like storytelling and good leadership. Uh, I also like being organized, but I try to make that more fun than the German stereotype would have you believe. And we're also supported by some of the incredible people you see here on screen. Um, New Zealand on Air's operations, finance, legal and communications team. They'll be joining us for our drop-in session after the talk, so definitely feel free to pop by and say hi to them. All right. So in today's talk, we will take you through a bit of an overview of the GDSR. Uh, we'll recap year one and look at some of the learnings and data we've had along the way. Uh, before we share some updates about year two, and then we'll invite you all to take a look at what's possible in the future with us by comparing or looking at some of the countries that had uh, supported the games industry for a little while longer. Finally, we'll have our AUA, our Ask Us Anything. So with that, Chantal, do you want to kick us off? All right, so I imagine most of you in the room are a little familiar with the games rebate, but we'll do a quick recap just in case. So last year, the government introduced the Game Development Sector Rebate, or GDSR, as we often refer to it, in response to strong calls from the industry for the need for more support. This came at a crucial time, especially with the Australian rebate pulling a lot of our local talent and studios across the ditch. The rebate was developed um, with the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment playing a key role in writing the policy. And the goal of the rebate is to help New Zealand games industry keep their talent in Aotearoa and support the growth of our incredible local studios. So by supporting the growth of people and projects, we're not only boosting the growth and sustainability of the industry, but also contributing to New Zealand's weightless exports, helping the country better recover and thrive post-recession and post-pandemic. The rebate is currently in place for three years with an annual budget capped at 40 million per year. And if you're a company actively developing digital games and have spent over 250,000 in a year on game development team members and the software they use to make those games, you're eligible to apply. Once your application is assessed and approved, you'll then get 20% back on all the eligible costs from the previous financial year. So with that, let's take a look at how our first year went, where we started with a pilot phase um, so that we could test our processes and gather feedback from nine of the largest studios in New Zealand who were able to apply for the first six months of that year and then claim their remaining six months in the general round with everyone else. This way we could make sure we got a complex set of financial data to test our guidelines and workflows and we took that forward into the general round which opened registration in at the end of 2023 um, for some early checks for eligibility. We then opened applications in the month of April and that led us into the assessment phase by our games and financial assessors who were able to then announce 33 successful studios who received the rebate. Um, one of them reached the cap in the pilot phase, uh, therefore in the general round it was 32. Um, and you see a breakdown on the map across New Zealand there. Now, in total, we paid out 22.3 million, which as you can tell, there's a bit of room to grow still towards our 40 million cap. Based on projections that we've got, uh, we believe 2027 will be the earliest that will reach that cap. Now, that's the overview, though. What about the impact? Chantal, over to you. Now, I know a lot of this can sound a bit dry and high level, so let's take a moment to dive into some of the real stories from individual studios so we can better understand the real impact the rebate is having on the people behind the scenes. As part of our work, Toby and I have spent a lot of time having one-on-one -on -one conversations with our local studios across the country, and what's been clear from these chats is just how real and significant the impact of the rebate has been for so many. On screen, you'll see a few of these stories and how this new support is benefiting studios during what is a particularly turbulent time in the international landscape. For some of the studios we've chatted to, the rebate has definitely been a real lifeline. While studios overseas are facing many massive layoffs due to the pressures of the current recession and due to that dwindling international investment, the new rebate has definitely helped save some jobs here in New Zealand. It's given studios the runway they needed to stabilize and get back on a growth path when many were previously bracing for tough cuts and potential layoffs. 
Some studios, which were forced to freeze wages because of the economic climate, have shared that they have finally been able to catch back up, bringing salaries back to industry standards and accounting for inflation. Just last year, the NZGDA reported that nearly 50% of our local studios were seriously considering relocating to Australia. Thanks to this, those conversations have mostly come to a halt now, which is really great to hear. It was just one or two studios still actively exploring that option. What's been even more exciting to hear is that many studios have shared that they are no longer just focusing on maintaining their existing live games, they're now starting to actively explore new projects. So thanks to the games industry's advocacy, the support that's been created is fueling fresh creativity and innovation. And so it's not just about dollars and cents, it's about supporting our local people, people who are enthusiastic about creating games, and it's giving them the ability to dream big again. Now, to give us a look at some of the other insights we've gathered over the past year, I'll hand back to Toby. He's got some fascinating, never before seen data about our local industry that's been gathered from this year's GDSR recipients. All right. I hope everyone is ready for some big numbers. The minister has shared a bit, and Joy um, as well. We've looked at the revenue across our 33 GDSR recipients, uh, where we see a total 98% of revenue coming from international sources. Now, those are weightless exports bringing money directly into our economy. Together with the 2% of domestic revenue, we're looking at just over 520 million revenue across the 33 recipients, um, which is, by the way, over 100 million more than Australia had in 2023. <laughs> now, we also looked at the number of game projects our studio has worked on, which was a total of 145 in the financial year of 2023-24. And they broke down in this way, where 70, 70 of these games were shipped projects that still had some form of work done, whether that's updates or sometimes just hosting costs. And 75 games were in various stages of development. Now, of course, not all of these games will be released next year, um, because innovation and prototyping takes iteration. But it's very cool to see so many games in our future that we might get our hands on. And of course, we've got more, two more graphs. This first one, we look at a split of the eligible expenditure. So this is the actual expenditure our recipients had um, approved as part of the GDSR, uh, where we see 81% in employee costs. Now, of course, that's financial speak for all of you guys, the people who are really doing this work. Um, then we had 13% in hosting and software services, followed by 4% of contractors. And while we thought this breakdown is cool, it gives us an idea, but what's actually happening within that 81%? So we looked at the number of people per department, which across our 33 studios is just over 1,000 people, with the high highest amount of people in art, UX, and UI, uh, with 380. Closely followed by programmers in, with 304, and then we have production and game design with about 100 each. Our projections suggest that with the funds added by the GDSR, we could see a growth of 118 jobs to this pie within the next year, which would be an 8% growth year on year and really cool to see. Now that wraps up what we have on year one. So Chantal, what can you tell us about year two? All right, I got a wall of information coming at you, so get your pens ready to take some notes. Um, so what's new? What are we doing to make sure our part of the ecosystem is always getting better? So to start, we've done a thorough review of our registration, application, and assessment processes from the past year, and we'll be making a few refinements to smooth things out, both for the industry, but also our assessment teams. First up, we're simplifying the registration and application process to avoid asking for the same information information more than once, because we know how frustrating that can be, and to speed things up so they're less drawn out. So registration for the 2024 to 25 financial year will open in January and close at the end of February, so please note these dates down in your company calendars. 
NZ On Air is also moving to a new, more purpose-built funding portal. So a note that all studios will need to register through this new system when the time comes, regardless of whether they were an applicant in the previous year. The registration process will be very straightforward. We'll basically pick be collecting um, contact details for a financial team member that we can call and ask questions if we need to, a games project team member, and a backup contact in case we can't reach the first two, because that definitely came up a lot this year. Um, this time, we will not be asking for any financial projections, and instead, we'll just be confirming that you feel confident that your studio's 24 to 25 financial year expenditure will surpass the 250,000 mark in eligible game dev staff and software costs. Since accreditation of the GDSR in your game and on your websites is a requirement for receiving taxpayer funds through the GDSR scheme. We'll also be pointing out the need to discuss this with any clients you may be working with. Also, we know accreditation can be complicated, particularly if you are working with clients, so if you need help, feel free to reach out to our team. We're currently working to refine our accreditation guidelines to better account for work for higher game studios, but we're always happy to help and provide guidance and take onboard feedback. Another important note for work for higher studios, if you are subcontracted to work for another New Zealand company, you'll need to check whether they have already received government funds for the same project, and we will be asking this during the registration phase. Our policy includes a strict no double dipping clause, so you can only apply for the GDSR if your costs are different from those covered by the public funds that potentially your client has received. Now for the application phase. This is when we'll be gathering info into your financial expenditure over the last year, as well as the game projects you've worked on. For now, the plan is to open applications in April, same as this year, with payments expected around July or August. We'll confirm the exact dates over the next couple of months, as we're currently working with the Ministry of Business to see if we can slightly extend the application and assessment timeframes, particularly with applications being due during a particular hectic month for all of New Zealand's accountants, April. So should we make this change, we might add a couple of weeks there, and applications would still open April 1st, but payments would more likely be made in August. To streamline the assessment process, this year we'll be providing a mandatory financial template that all studios will need to complete. This will help reduce the number of times we have to contact you for clarifications, but it will also be a living document that you can continue to use over the years. The template will be shared in November, so you'll have plenty of time to start collating your data before April. We'll also make some minor adjustments to how we collect information about your games projects, and we'll communicate these changes well ahead of April, so you'll have ample time to prepare. Lastly, as well as the funding portal, NZ On Air will be launching a brand new website uh, later on this year. So things might look a little bit different in there, but it should be more intuitive and user friendly. So now that we've explored the GDSR, let's turn our attention to what other countries have done to support, uplift and empower their games industries over the past decade by looking at their successes and strategies, as well as the impact of that long-term support, we can learn from their experience and see what it may be possible to create here if we work together. So, one of the countries we've reached out to, reached out to for learnings is the United Kingdom. They've introduced a video game tax relief in 2014 and have been running that for exactly 10 years now. Uh, as of 2024, they are adapting to a video game expenditure credit, uh, which acts much more as a 25% rebate on core game development activities. Now, they have a pretty strict definition of core game development, so dif differences apply. Um, since 2014, we can see that the number of game developers in the UK have tripled. From 150 studios in the first year, we are up to 455 studios uh, that claimed the VGTR in the last year. And similarly, from 150 games to 485 games. The UK industry has about 27,000 employees with just 3% freelancers, and it is worth just about 16 billion New Zealand dollars. This 
amount has been growing between 4 and 10% throughout the last 10 years, which makes it Europe's second largest games industry after Germany. Um, but they've overtaken Germany in game sales in the last year. So this meant, and I might um, point out the graph on the left that you can't really read, um, that shows you the amount of tax relief that was paid out throughout the last few years. And you can see that growth over time very clearly. So every pound invested into the economy by the UK government uh, led to an additional value of 1.72 pound. This meant a gross value added to the economy in 2021 that was equivalent to 6.85 billion New Zealand dollars, which shows us or gives us a good idea of the scale of growth we could be seeing in New Zealand in the coming years. Now, we've also looked at a little-known country called Finland, um, which Chantal can tell us a little more about their approach to the games ecosystem. Alrighty, so Finland's uh, games industry provides a fantastic example for us to look at, especially given the similarities in population size between our two countries. So for over a decade, Finland has been strategically investing in its games industry, giving us a really clear picture of what we might hope to achieve over the next 10 years and how sustained support can lead to long-term growth and success. So let's take a look at some of the key elements that have positioned Finland as a global leader in game development. So one piece of their success are programs like Tempo Funding, similar to New Zealand's code, which provide game studios with grants to test new concepts and explore markets without them taking on the full financial risk at that early stage of business. Another key factor is Finland's collaborative ecosystem supported by, the, by games hubs across the country that foster partnerships, resource sharing and innovation, creating a vibrant community where game developers can thrive together. Finland's global reputation has now meant that they're able to attract lots of senior talent from around the world, bringing in much needed new expertise. International partnerships supported by their embassies overseas, just how we kind of have with New Zealand trade and enterprise here, allow studios to connect with global markets and investors, further driving international growth. Education has also played a pivotal role. Universities offer hands-on game development programs, working closely with the industry to ensure the graduates are well prepared to enter the workforce. Programs led by the games industry ensure that students are also connected with professionals before they even graduate, and internships are really plentiful there, helping foster early career growth. So the result? Finland's games industry has flourished, reaching a turnover of over 5.3 billion New Zealand dollars. So long-term government support combined with the efforts of the local games industry has transformed their sector into a cornerstone of their national economy with contributions from both industry giants like Supercell and Rovio and now a wave of rising startups, Finland continues to make amazing games and attract opportunities as well as foreign investment from companies like Netflix. Their success shows us what's possible with a variety of support in place and it's a model worth learning from as we look to work collaboratively across our organisations and across this industry to elevate everyone. So looking at these insights and thinking back to that story of a Kiwi game studio that received support throughout their journey, we can see what's possible when a vision is supported every step of the way. From a scrappy startup barely getting by to a thriving, sustainable business that not only creates incredible games, but also nurtures their people. The transformation witnessed elsewhere is proof of what can be achieved when the right foundation is in place. Resources, education, mentorship, connection, and an ecosystem that supports the growth of local businesses. Now, imagine if that wasn't just one story, but the story of many. A future where New Zealand is known globally as a hub for game development where 19 out of 20 studios find success creating games that resonate with players around the world. Together, in partnership with key organisations like Code, the NZGDA, NZT and all of you, we can help shape a future where studio sustainability, talent, creativity and innovation are supported along their way to success. By working collaboratively, we can ensure that New Zealand's games industry grows to become a leader on the international stage, known for its thriving studios and globally impactful games. 
The next success story is already being written and it's up to all of us to make sure it thrives. Now, Toby's going to have fun trying to speak to the slide since you can't see it. <laughs> That's all good. That brings us to about the end of our talk. Um, so on the next slide, we are just going to suggest to stay in touch with us. You can sign up to our newsletter. There is a QR code on this slide, uh, which you can't see. <laughs> but here's the trick. If you look at the back of your name tag, there are QR codes to our newsletter and to our website, um, the NZ on Air website, where we have a bunch of details on the policy and the guidelines. Um, so definitely do have a look if you want to get stuck in there. You can always reach us on our Games Rebate inbox, which is gamesrebate at nzonair.gov.nz. Um, again, might be up there soon. Um, and further, we will be offering webinars in the lead up to January and then further into uh, April, probably starting with a one-on-one -on -one, um, for those who are wanting to get into the rebate for the first time, and then with more stuff uh, in the new year. You can find us on LinkedIn. We're always happy to connect and chat, so please don't be shy and reach out. And um, I was going to say, we'll leave this slide up. We'll see if we get it up um, as we transition into our Ask Us Anything. And we'll open up to the floor. Yeah, thank you, everyone. So if anyone does have any questions, I've just got a microphone here, so I'll dash around and pick anything up. Hi. Um, I was wondering if, uh, considering we didn't fill the quota to $40 million for the grant, um, if there was any uh, thoughts about lowering the $250,000 um, entry requirement at all? Uh, not at the moment. I think as far as I'm aware, uh, the 250000 is quite a bit lower than most countries. So I think in Australia it's 500000 to qualify for their rebate. So what we're kind of looking to do is essentially work collaboratively with Code. So Code is kind of helping support a lot of those studios that are either brand new startups or maybe veteran team members that have come out of other studios and started their own. They're kind of helping support them up to that 250000 mark and then they kind of graduate into the GDSR and we take over from there. So actually, it's one of the lowest kind of um, starting rates of the countries we've looked into. Any other questions? Uh, you kind of stole my question, so I'll have to put a spin on it. Um, similar question, so is there any views on potentially redeploying the extra amount you know, in other ways into the industry? And then sort of related to that, Australia's obviously 30% and New Zealand's 20%. Is there any, um, you obviously mentioned 2027 is when you expect to hit that cap. But before that, is there any avenue or thought to potentially increase it up to the 30% to be competitive with the Australian regime? Um, at the moment, no, like we have talked to the Ministry of Business and that additional money has gone back into the economy, I think, to kind of help our doctors and nurses and all of those sorts of things. Um, and so I think like their approach to designing it at 20% where it currently sits is quite strategic because what we've seen in Australia is, yes, they do have a really big rebate. And what that rebate has done is it has attracted really big studios into the country. But then those studios have... Um, poached a lot of the staff from the smaller indies, and a lot of those studio revenues are actually also going overseas. Um, so what we're trying to do here is actually support local businesses. So our goal is to help spread the word of the rebate so that we can attract investment into our existing businesses and help our local companies thrive. So it's been quite strategically designed so that, you know, there's a chance maybe we will attract a couple big studios, but it's not the goal. The goal is to help out local businesses and um, particularly our indies. We kind of have a few big studios in New Zealand, although I say New Zealand big, obviously it's probably small to America, but um, we have a few big and then we've got lots of small. So our hope is to help those small grow into medium businesses. Any other questions? Go on the front here.
Uh, kia ora. Uh, is there any thought about you guys providing uh, sort of industry rates um, when we're looking to hire additional staff in the future? I think the last thing I've seen was around 2022. And I was just wondering if you guys have the information on industry rates and are willing to share that with uh, indie studios looking to hire. Oh, so you mean like the average salary rates? Yeah, yeah, just looking at like what industry rates are within New Zealand. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. I mean, we do gather a lot of salary data across the studios we work with, so that's something we could maybe anonymise and collate in the future. Um, I know the NZGDA has a spreadsheet where they kind of have the averages. I saw it last time, I think a couple of years ago, so I'd have to check with them if that's like up to date. But yeah, maybe that is something that we can work on providing to the industry, because um, yeah, it definitely helps. And we want to see pay parity across all roles, you know, artists being paid the same as programmers, all of those sorts of things. So um, yeah, maybe that's something we can add. I'll just add, um, that's a chance to collaborate with the GDA in our ecosystem that we have, um, which is something we want to deepen um, throughout next year and get more into that conversation. Are you likely to review and possibly modify the eligibility requirements, whether for studios, projects, or line items within them and through these future years, or is that kind of set in stone? Yeah, we're always getting feedback from the games industry. Currently, um, for those that might not know how it works, essentially, we just have to determine if you're making digital games and if you're spending over 250000 on... The people that are making the games, it, it doesn't account for operations team members and things like that, mainly because um, I think the Ministry of Business when writing the policy was aware of the fact that if the games industry was able to pay all of those people more, it would create a market distortion for all other industries wanting to also hire the same people in operations accounting roles. So um, what was the question again? I went on a full tangent there. Review. Are you re oh, you're yes. reviewing yeah. the eligibility? So, um, one of the things we've had to look into is that how do we determine what software is eligible and what isn't? And really, it's, it's relatively straightforward. It's um, who on the team is using it and how are they using it. So we essentially will be providing more documentation on how to assess that when you're tracking across your team, so that um, there are like really clear yeses and there are really clear noes, but then there's a whole column of maybes. So AI is a good example of that, where if, say, an operations team member is using AI to help write their emails more efficiently, then that wouldn't be covered by the rebate. But say a programmer is using it in the initial stages of coding to just speed up their pipeline a bit, then that would be covered. So those sorts of things are always in discussion with the industry and we're always getting feedback and passing that along. In terms of staff members, that's pretty black and white. It's anyone that's contributing to the making of the game. And so even in other industries where maybe say a CEO would typically not be working directly in a product. In the games industry, we know that does happen a bit. So we just get people to provide us the percentage breakdown of like how much time did that person spend in this area and in the other. So we always take on board feedback and um, refining things. But other than that, the feedback's really useful because um, we do a review every couple of years with the Ministry of Business who looks through the policy writing and those sorts of things so we can pass the feedback along to them. So definitely keep sending it through if there's anything that you think is maybe missing. Yeah, which um, there are formal reviews scheduled for year two and year four and going on, um, which the Ministry of Business will also use to reach out to some of the studios for more feedback. But the more we can add into that, the more we can consider uh, improving into the future. Yeah, good question. Any others? Alrighty, we might wrap it up here. And we actually have a drop-in session after this, I think, at 11.10. Um, so that is upstairs in the kind of breakout space over that way. So if you just want to pop by and have a chat and say hi to the team, feel free. And if you have any other questions but don't enjoy jumping on a microphone, which is very valid, then um, feel free to pop over there. Now, we have some little giveaways. They are very nerdy. Um, but we were using them at work and actually found them just really quite fun. So um, we have some fidget spinners if you would like to take some home, um, just to you know, keep us in your memory when you're at work. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, and have a really great conference. <laughs>